Well, thank you, Francis, uh, for that uh, terrific opening uh, talk. I'm Eric Green, director of the National Human Genome Research Institute. And I want, as a co-host of this meeting, I want to thank all of you uh, for coming as well and join the others in saying what I think a spectacular opportunity this is to gather all of you and thank you so much for traveling far distances in some cases to join us for the next two days. What I was asked to do was to describe the National Human Genome Research Institute's portfolio in genomic medicine. Now, by way of history, recognize that we are one of the 27 institutes and centers that make up the National Institutes of Health. And we were created by the U.S. Congress just before the beginning of the Human Genome Project to lead NIH's efforts in the Human Genome Project. And for many years, that was the major focus, of course, of what our institute did. But about 11 years ago, when the Human Genome Project ended, of course, we reoriented our, our mission in many ways to take on the spectacular opportunities afforded by having sequenced the human genome and in many ways now focus on advancing human health through genomics research. What I want to tell you about in particular is the more genomic medicine oriented aspects of our portfolio. And, and one of the things we have done in particular over the last couple of years is make sure we have a very clear definition of what we mean by genomic medicine. In fact, we went through a formal process both internal to the institute and involving some of our advisors to make sure we all agreed upon what we meant when we said genomic medicine, and this is the definition. We settled on an emerging medical discipline that involves using genomic information about an individual as part of their clinical care, for example, for diagnostic or therapeutic decision making, and other implications of that <coughs> clinical use. And there are several things to point out about this definition. First of all, it's purposely narrow, and we wanted to make it that so that it wasn't all things in, to bring under the umbrella of genomic medicine. And by genomic, we mean direct information about nucleic acids, DNA or RNA. And while we recognize downstream products are important, uh, they're just outside of this immediate view that we have in downstream products such as uh, proteomics, metabolomics, and so forth. We keep this strictly focused on an analyzing and information about nucleic acids. And finally, we really metaphorically view this as a key def destination for attaining our mission for improving health through genomics research. This is where we are heading, and very much where the Institute is focused on is a journey that began with the completion of the Human Genome Project and aims to realize genomic medicine broadly defined. But as Francis alluded to, and is absolutely the case, there's going to be many, many steps involved in this. We can see some of these steps, and some of them we haven't even anticipated yet. But our institute is focused on trying to travel this journey, figure out what the barriers are, and do research that would allow us to make this progression in a productive way. And so what has the institute done? Well, literally the day the Genome Project ended, as was very much part of the culture of genomics, we published a strategic vision of what was needed starting the day the Genome Project ended, and that was in 2003. And while that was a, a, a very effective strategic view at the time, it certainly, it certainly didn't even last the decade. Um, and in fact, or the, it didn't last a full decade, and we found ourselves in need of a new strategic vision a couple of years ago, and so indeed in 2011 we published one. And the key distinguishing feature of this strategic vision was an absolute clear articulation of the clinical applications of genomics, which I don't think we were quite prepared to do in 2003, but by 2011 we felt the phrase genomic medicine and the reality of genomic medicine was in close enough view that it was time to be more descriptive of what we thought was going to be needed in terms of a research agenda to get us to the point of practicing genomic medicine. And what we finally settled in on as part of the strategic planning process was a recognition that there was a series of progressive domains of research activities that were very logical and that were very effective in leading us down this path uh, towards realizing genomic medicine. Let me just briefly introduce you uh, to these five domains. Um, some are quite familiar to us because we had been involved in them for a long time, such as understanding the structure of genomes and then going on in efforts like ENCODE, understanding the biology of genomes. But probably a little more new to our institute was a, a clear articulation of research objectives related to human disease, recognizing that doing genomics research to understand the biology of disease was a critically next, important next step. And then moving on and, and looking at genomic research to advance the science of medicine, but also recognizing that we needed to demonstrate that this was going to truly improve the effectiveness of healthcare. 
So these five domains became, if you will, a research framework for almost everything I think that the Institute is doing now. And a centerpiece of our strategic plan we published in 2011 was this figure, it was figure two, which depicted these five uh, domains of research activity over different time intervals and these density plots uh, simply represent um, uh, in a graphical fashion different stages of, of or different sets of accomplishments and when they occurred and r where they occur relative to these five different domains, uh, including predicting into the future. So these first two domains would largely be regarded as more basic science-oriented activities, understanding genomes both structurally and functionally. And these three domains bring us more into, um, if you will, applied genomics, either looking specifically at disease processes or more clinical applications um, in the fourth and the fifth domain. And this starts to focus in much more on what we mean by genomic medicine. But let me clarify further, because we certainly find in discussions that sometimes people will lump all three of those in and call them genomic medicine. What we mean by this domain three is discovery research, establishing genotype-phenotype associations for human diseases. And I list several such examples that one would easily consider to fall under this middle domain, domain three, of discovery research. The, the fourth domain puts us more into the clinical realm in terms of doing clinical validation studies to assess the outcomes from using genomic information for clinical care and digging deeper to do research to demonstrate that truly there is validation associated with uh, the use of genomic information in this way. And then domain five, five is really clinical implementation, truly developing processes for using genomic information for clinical care. Interestingly, we don't regard domain three as genomic medicine, even though at the moment it's probably the largest single block of funding we are doing is in disease-oriented work using genomics. But this is not what we mean by genomic medicine. What we truly mean by genomic medicine are domains four and five. So this is absolutely much more in the clinical validation and the clinical implementation stages of this five domain progression. So with that in mind, let me give you examples. I'm going to give you six major areas of NHGRI programs in genomic medicine. Mostly you're going to hear about this from other speakers. As Francis alluded to, some of sort of the cutting edge, leading edge, or lowest hanging fruit, if you will, in terms of opportunities in genomic medicine are clearly in the cancer genomics realm. Many activities we have going on in this, including some of the pilot projects you're going to hear about later, but also we coming out of the Cancer Genome Atlas, a joint venture between our institute and the National Cancer Institute, are new discussions between those two institutes about new opportunities one can envision in the future uh, for doing more real, truly clinical applications of genomics for cancer care. So it's clearly an area we are involved in. Another low-hanging fruit, if you will, cutting edge, uh, relates to pharmacogenomics, one that I think many, many uh, in investigators around the world actually are certainly pursuing. And coming up later this morning, you're going to hear from Dan Rode, who's both going to tell you about the eMERGE network, but also a component of the eMERGE network that now is, represents NHGRI's investment in pharmacogenomics research. A third uh, area of programs for our institute I, I regard as I call them test drive programs, taking out genomics in the clinic as a test drive, if you will. And you're going to hear from others about two such test drive programs. Uh, Lucia Hindorf is going to tell you about our Clinical Sequencing Exploratory Research, or CSER program. And Jeff Ginsburg is going to tell you about a brand new effort called Implementing Genomics in Practice, practice or the IGNITE Consortium. We're also very interested in opportunities uh, such as in the newborn period. And we have a new program on newborn genomic analyses. In particular, you're going to hear from Anastasia Wise, who's going to tell you about a new program we have in partnership with another institute at NIH, the National Institute of Child Health and Development, on our newborn sequencing program. Two other, the last two areas, uh, relate, the first one relates to what I would call clinical genomics information systems. And here is something we hear from many people, uh, 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 from many of our grantees and many of the people when I travel around and talk to people, the recognition that there is this onslaught of information about genomic variants and as they relate to disease. And these are pouring into the clinic in principle and eventually will find their way into electronic medical records. 
but practicing healthcare professionals are overwhelmed by that, that, that incoming um, data and information about publications. We need to develop uh, better knowledge bases, better processes for establishing those knowledge bases that will simply allow practicing healthcare professionals to know what it means when they encounter a genomic variant in a patient. And so just out of the gates is a new initiative um, called ClinGen or Clinical Genome Resource that we are creating. Um, and um, uh, we're not going to have a, a talk about this because it's so, but it's something you clearly uh, will want to be hearing about and be monitoring. It's our investment in this important clinical information um, uh, arena uh, with respect to genomic variants and genomic information. And finally, our last area relates to sort of the ultra rare genetic disease diagnostics. <coughs> and here you need to look, look no further than the literature to recognize the remarkable number of review articles that are now appearing where clinical sequencing is truly being done as part of uh, diagnostics, especially for ultra rare genetic d diseases. And uh, Francis introduced you to the Undiagnosed Diseases Program. And indeed, this is an NIH wide uh, program. Um, that is now going uh, beyond just what's happening at the NIH as a program to a network of centers around the country. And NHGRI is one of the lead institutes in helping um, uh, lead this, uh, both uh, with respect to what's going on at NIH and with respect to this network. So just to add a few more details to what Francis mentioned, we're going to build upon the successful experience with the Undiagnosed Diseases Program, which was just at NIH, to now build a network of these centers around the country to improve the diagnosis and care of patients with undiagnosed diseases facilitate research into the etiology of undiagnosed diseases, and create a highly collaborative research community to identify best practices for the diagnosis and management of undiagnosed disorders. So in summary, those are the six major areas of genomic medicine programs that NHGRI is carrying out. You know, historically, and even right now, the major emphasis of what we're doing um, very much is in the arena of understanding how genomes are put together, particularly how they're working, how genomes function, and this will continue to be a high priority for the rest of this decade and beyond. But as I alluded earlier, probably our biggest investment right now, if you follow the dollars, is using genomics to understand the molecular basis of human disease. The six areas I just introduced you to, the genomic medicine portfolio of the Institute, it's very much about the future. It's not so much about advances that are going to happen this decade. It's building a foundation for what we think are going to be spectacular advances in the application of genomic medicine uh, beyond 2020. Finally, if you are interested in monitoring or following um, what's happening at the Institute, just a few months ago I created a monthly um, email update that I send out to anybody interested, and I guarantee you we will be chronicling our um, programs, both current and future ones, um, in these uh, monthly newsletters that I send out. If you are interested in receiving them, especially with, I'm delighted to communicate to international audiences, if you just go to the simple URL, genome.gov backslash director, and down there you'll find a link that will allow you to sign up for our listserv, and you would be able to get these monthly updates for me if you're so interested. Finally, I just want to say um, a couple words about the special thing that's going to happen tomorrow morning for this group. Uh, we thought it was too good of an opportunity to have you here in D.C., especially downtown, and not be able to see um, something that NHGRI is particularly proud of. It relates to what I was just talking about. Part of the responsibility of, of, of seeing a genomic medicine research uh, program uh, grow with time is the recognition that part of the success of this is going to require uh, public engagement, public education, and public literacy in genomics. And one of several things we're doing, but certainly the flagship now, is um, a partnership we develop with the Smithsonian Institution, in particular the National Museum of Natural History, uh, to create an exhibition at the National Museum of Natural History. This came out of some discussions we had them a couple of years ago, and then ended up in, in, in a decision to create such an exhibition. Um, and that exhibition just opened uh, fairly recently and really just down the street from here. And we thought it was just too good of an opportunity, so we rearranged the schedule and have all of you have breakfast there and be able to tour the exhibition for an hour, hour and a half. Um, so you'll be entering that building tomorrow morning. Um, this exhibition just opened um, earlier this year. 
It's at the National Museum of Natural History. It's a fairly sizable exhibition, as you'll see. Um, and it's in Hall 23. If you don't remember Hall 23, there's two ways to remember it. First of all, humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. That's one way. <laughs> but if you get lost, although we won't allow you to get lost, because you're actually getting into the museum before it even opens, but all you got to do is find your way to the Hope Diamond and take a left. That's all you do to find it. We're immediately adjacent to the Hope Diamond, uh, the number one visited exhibition um, at this, this museum. This, you'll meet tomorrow the director of the museum, Kirk Johnson, and he will proudly tell you it is the number one visited natural history museum in the world. It is the number two visited museum in the world, second only to the Louvre in Paris. Um, this will be resident at this museum for one year, and you will see it tomorrow morning, and then it's going to tour North America for four to five years. So you will be there before the museum even opens, but we'll keep you just in Hall 23, because I don't want you wandering around. You'll get lost with a bunch of dinosaurs. So. <laughs> With that, um, and if you're interested in learning more about the exhibition or read about it or see a preview before you get there tomorrow morning, um, a simple a website that we've got, not a simple website, a simple URL, unlockinglifescode.org, brings you to a spectacularly wonderful website associated with the exhibition. Um, and so please look at that and tell your colleagues about it, especially those in your home country who can't travel here to see it. They can take a virtual tour of the exhibition at this website. Uh, thank you for your attention. I look forward to spending the next two days with you.